So you were actually married to the real life Wolf of Wall Street. You were manipulated, dominated, threatened, intimidated, gaslit, abused, love bombed in your relationship that was actually then seen as entertainment by over a billion people in the mega hit movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. Now knowing what you know now about your ex, how would you spot a wolf in sheep's clothing? Back then when I was living it, you know, I had no idea. And so the way that I would spot a wolf in sheep's clothing is, are they a love bomber? Do you get so much love and admiration and flattery and gifts from them right away? Uh, those things seem wonderful, but often if they're too good to be true, they are. <laughs> and also, does the person's words match their actions, right? Do they actually follow up and say, do what they say they're going to do? And uh, do they allow you to have boundaries? Because a lot of pathological people don't respect your boundaries because they don't respect who you are as a person. So as, as you see in the movie, um, Margot goes on a date as me, right? I go on a date with Jordan and I come home to an apartment full of flowers. I mean, that was real. So I lived in a small 800 square foot place and there were so many flowers in there that I couldn't fit in. Mm -hmm. And that was just so strange to me. It just, my gut was like, who does this? Why is that, you know, why is that necessary? Really? We had just had a conversation. And actually, the way I got on that date is pretty fascinating in that somebody was calling me, this woman who I didn't even really know, calling me and calling me and I, to go out. And I didn't want to go out because I didn't know her. She wasn't my friend, but she was really harassing me to the point that she got me to go out with her, which meant with him that I didn't know that he had paid her $15,000 to get me set up on this date. And so my gut, when she kept calling me, was like, this is weird. Why is she asking me? And I remember saying to her, okay, finally I'll go. And she said, well, you know, that guy Jordan's going to be there. And I said, isn't he married? And she said, what do you care? And I said, no, I don't care. I just think it's strange. Right. So there were these little nuanced things that my gut was saying, danger, strange, danger. But I just, as a young 22 year old girl, I just pushed it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for breaking that down because I'm always living in that real moment of, if I went into my apartment and had an apartment full of flowers, that would make me feel good. Yes, it did make me feel good. And that's the uh, trick with these guys, exactly, right? Yeah. It's good, but you still have that uh-oh moment. And it just seemed, it just seemed strange. Mm -hmm. You know, you just, you just don't do that. And then, you know, he would, um, send $15,000 in cash. She <laughs> would do all of these over the top things, which again, I always had that this is great and fun, but it's weird. So how would you now then not get trapped in that? Because there's that gut intuition, like you said, yes. that's telling you this is weird. Yes. But at the same time, because it feels good, because yeah. it's unfamiliar. Yeah. You can convince yourself in that moment, but like maybe he's just really nice. Like he really just does care about you. Yeah. So how do you make sure that that doesn't become the trap that lures you in? Yes. I think if I was going to go back in time, I wouldn't ignore that uh-oh. I wouldn't ignore that gut or I would explore it more. Or I would challenge it more. Like, like when he sat down for dinner, let's say when I was set up, you know, to say to him, why are you here? aren't you married? You know, I was just like coquettish and we just had a great conversation. And so I think I would trust that gut feeling and be inquisitive and curious and use my voice to find out the truth because I didn't know I was being groomed and lured in. Right. And I just wouldn't trust that feel good dopamine feeling. Mm, that groomed word really hit me. Yeah. So is that how you feel that that was moments of grooming for yes. you to become under his control? Yes. I call it like a slow insidious burn. Like it's, it just, it happens and it just keeps happening. And, and, um, and you feel so good and you feel so alive because it's the beginning of an infatuation. So it's, it's hard to get out. It puts you in a trance almost. Mm. And there are little things along the way and the goalposts keep moving. And so 
And so then you're hooked, right? Because the grooming happens because they're adoring and helpful and generous. But then it gets turned. And it was, you know, if you don't marry me, I'm not going to date you. If you don't have children, right, I'm not going to marry you. So there's all this grooming and this luring in and you're in love. And then it goes like, boom. Now you're, now the control starts, but you're already so sucked in. Do you remember that first moment that you saw yeah. that? It was with that whole, um, you know, if you don't marry me, mm. I'm not going to date you. And I was like, what? I don't want to get married. I'm 23, you know, but I didn't understand what domination and intimidation and coercive control was back then. I didn't understand what boundaries were. I didn't know he was plowing through my boundaries because a trauma bond needs two conditions to exist. And the first one is intermittent reinforcement. And it's that extreme generous helpfulness, kindness, appreciation, love that you initially feel, right? But then it's the cruelty, the controlling, the lying or the betrayal that also happens. And what happens is that it's the extremity of both of those feelings and behaviors that keep you bonded to the person. And the research shows, and I wrote about this in my book, and when I read this research, I felt such joy because such validation that with animal trainers, if they treat animals like that, the animal bonds more to the trainer that uses intermittent reinforcement than this the trainer that uses straight kindness. By over like 200%, yeah, I think. Yeah, 230%. Yeah. Right. Yep. And that creates the two masks of the person, the, the generous, loving, kind person and the cruel, controlling lying individual. And so if you start to see this, let's say in the dating phase, that's a massive red flag massive red to flag. not then obviously marry him, settle down, because then I assume it becomes way more difficult to leave the more yes. enmeshed you guys are. Yes, the more bonded that you become. Mm -hmm. And then let's just say, you know, you're, you're emotionally dependent on them. You're financially dependent on them or you have children with them, mm -hmm. right? It gets harder and harder to get yourself out. And that, you know, that brings me to the second um factor in a trauma bond is the power imbalance, right? And so the power imbalance also needs to be there. And just by the very fact that you love someone, they have power over you, right? Mm -hmm. And so they can abuse it. And then if you live with a dominating, intimidating, coercively controlling person, they gain power over you because you fear them, right? And then the social power index is explains it as someone who makes most of the decisions about the home, the car, the kids, the life. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that power imbalance mixed with the intermittent abuse are the two conditions that have to be there. And we certainly had a power imbalance mm -hmm. because he made so much money and had so much power, you know, even though there was only a five-year age difference between us. Yeah. Was Jordan the first type of guy that you had met that was like that, where he was like lavishing and over the top and eccentric? I would say so. I'd say he's one of a kind. But do you yeah. then think that that became part of the enamor? And the reason why I ask this yeah. is because a lot of people are attracted, yeah. maybe subconsciously, to the excitement of the extreme. And yes. in that, we end up ignoring the good guy, the guy that's stable, the guy that's yes. very consistent. Yes. I always was drawn to successful men that were in their power. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that was about because I didn't own my own power. So I projected that power onto them, right? So I was very enamored by their power because I think, as of course, as a 22-year-old young girl, I didn't understand how I could connect to my power, right? So that definitely was a piece of it. But he was definitely in his own league with that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where it's kind of, you know, I, I love to like really get deep into yeah. like that initial thing because what attracts us to that? I'm very attracted to ambition. And because of that, it comes with someone working a lot. So the things that you're attracted to has a consequence, let's say. Now, sometimes that consequence can be extreme, right? Where if they're grandiose, yes, yes. then it can become extreme yes. in both ends. Yes. But often what I've realized is a lot of us, and I'm going to speak for myself, ignore the good guy. 
The yes. guy that's, again, consistent, doesn't have the highs, doesn't have the lows. Yes. And now, unfortunately, we're maybe uh, labeling them as boring. Correct. Versus someone like you watch Wolf of Wall Street. I'm going to be honest. It seems like I want to hang out with him. Yes. Like I just want to have a crazy party with him. Like yes. even though I wouldn't, but it just there's cl weird glamour yes. and notoriety and um, influence with that. Yes, yes, and a more um, I don't want to say normal person, but a more pedestrian person, mm -hmm. right? Wasn't going to go after me in that way, right? So there was more about like him choosing me than me choosing him, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, yeah. right? So uh, like, a, a, let's say a, a person who's not as grandiose, let's use that word, isn't going to pursue me as much. And so I just might be a little bit more laissez-faire about it. I'm sure I overlooked some very nice men, um, but, you know, grandiose, magnetic, charismatic, charming people are very alluring. Mm. I mean, all we have to do is look at our political life, our media, you know, we're, we're, they're fascinating. And he was fascinating and very bright and very cute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and you call him a pathological lover. Yes. So talk to me about that. What is a pathological lover? Yes. And why is that maybe a sign that we can start to identify if they are or not, that it could lead to potential uh, turmoil down the road? Right. So the reason why I use the term pathological lover is because pathological means mentally unwell. So I describe this person as someone who will use, harm, betray, and exploit you to get their needs met for money, power, pleasure, or status. Stat. So anybody who will do that, in my eyes, is mentally unwell. I don't look at people as a means to an end. I look at people as a means to connect and bond and grow with. And so that's why I use the term pathological lover, because they're very complex. That's them on a basic level. And a lot of people throw in the word narcissist. And so narcissists are actually lighter. They have a lot lighter aspects. Yes, they're self-absorbed. They're entitled. They can be grandiose. But these people can also be Machiavellian, which means manipulative, psychopathic, which means very cold and callous and can attach, and even sadistic. So they're very layered people. It's not just narcissism. Mm, yeah, it's so complex. And you even talk in your book, you call it, um, are they twisted or tender? Yeah. Are they a lover or a torturer? Yes. When you can confuse those two and you don't know which one's which, Holy smokes. No wonder so many of us are getting freaking trapped now in these types yes. of relationships. Yes. And um, there's a scene actually in A Wolf of Wall Street that I'd love to talk about. Sure. It's a scene where, and I've heard you say it didn't actually happen like that because you weren't necessarily a jealous person, but it's where Margot Robert goes into the room and splashes water on yes. uh, Leo as he's sleeping. And there's that scene, he gets up and he screams. And then he starts to become dominant. And then he realizes yes. that doesn't work. Yes. And then he starts to be sweet and he starts to pull her closer. Come on, yes, I love you. Yes. Then she doesn't fall for it. So then he flips again and he gets mad at her again. And so seeing this one scene where you've got this one person go through these changes of, uh, of um, strategy of how he's trying to yes. manipulate you. Yes. He sees one thing doesn't work and then he tries That's something right. else. Was that accurate? Yes. Yes. And I think that the way you explained it is really brilliant. I hadn't even thought of the scene like that. So thank you for breaking it down yeah. like that. Yeah. It's, the, it's that manipulative. There, it's constant manipulation. And so this is a hard part that I say to a lot of women because they'll come in and they'll say, but he was so nice and he brought my cat this and he did this, or he, he picked up my dry cleaning or he cooked me dinner. And I say to them, I hate to tell you this, the nice part is manipulative too. And I, and it breaks my heart to, and I always, you know, say that to them, I'm going to say something hard and I know it's really hard to hear, but the nice part was part of the manipulation to lure you, to groom you, to get you to fall in love, to get you to be in their trance. Mm -hmm. But you saw that. Yeah. Because he's trying to manipulate her. Yeah. He's like, okay, that didn't work. Let me try this. Oh, that didn't work. Let me try that. And it's in the, I mean, it's in the space of, you know, a minute. Yes. And so when something like that's happening, if you don't have the confidence, if you don't actually understand what is going on, right. um, 
and that person holds the power, right. I can see how that can be such a trap. And you said like he had, I mean, he, the wealth and the fame and the power that he had yes. over you. Um, and once you started to notice these toxic behavioral things happen, yeah. um, what was your mental thinking? Were you looking for an out? Were you looking to just make peace within that relationship mm -hmm. because so many people i think just try to make peace in the relationship yeah first of all i was in love right so i wanted things to be calm and peaceful and i'm a actually a confident woman and i think i was grandiose in my own thinking that i thought that i could control jordan belfort uh -huh. <laughs> and not control him but that i had that he loved me enough that he would change that he would see the light that if I worked a little harder, if I did a little better, if I please him a little bit more, if I, so I was always trying to distort myself, I think, to try to get him to calm down and be kinder or not do drugs, really. Sometimes I'd be strong, sometimes I'd be tough, but nothing I did mattered because it wasn't about me. You say in your book that hope is a hook. Yeah. Yeah, hope is the hook. And especially, I'm a highly optimistic person. You really are. <laughs> You're so damn optimistic. And so I always just see the best in everybody. I assume the best about everybody, about situations. I'm just born. My name, Nadine, means hope. Oh. So, um, so it's just part of who I am. Yeah, and hope kept me hooked, and it keeps a lot of women hooked, especially if after somebody hurts you, then, you know, the next day they bring a horse down your driveway because they know you like to ride horses. Uh, it buys you a bow or a yacht. Yeah. Um, actually, that's interesting when you were saying about the controlling that you you definitely gave your own. I'd love to go a little deeper in that. Sure. Because I was in a very toxic relationship before I met my husband. Okay. And it was about four years. I was very young. I started at 15. So you can imagine. I don't oh, even know who I am. Baby, yeah. yeah, such a baby. And what I want to be always honest about is over time, I became toxic too as a protective mechanism yes. in that relationship. Yes. So every time he would give it, I would try to just give it as good as I could get. Yes. A big part of a trauma bond is you lose yourself. And so I did lose that, I think, some of my goodness. I did become more toxic or as what we would call more reactive abuse, mm -hmm. right? Because after time and time, you, you, I've had it. So I would react in ways that I thought were very ugly that I didn't like about myself. But again, I was so confused and I had so much cognitive dissonance, you know, which we'll address, yeah. you know, that I just was like in a maze in my head, you know, but I knew slowly but surely I wasn't reaching my potential in life and love by living with him. Mm -hmm. I knew that and I saw myself start to start to fall apart. Do you mind talking about cognitive dissonance? Yeah, yeah, that's a really important term. And cognitive dissonance is when we feel um, mentally, we have an internal conflict because two ideas that we're holding don't aren't congruent, right? So that happens from the two sides of the mask. Mm -hmm. So you have the loving love bomber, the generous, helpful guy, and the sadistic, cruel guy. And so you start to think, is he good, is he bad? Is this relationship good or bad? Um, am I healthy or unhealthy? And so you constantly have cognitive dissonance about him, about yourself. How could I stay with him? I'm supposed to be a moral, ethical person. How, am, how could I stay with him? And about the relationship. So you have three layers of cognitive dissonance ping-ponging all the time in your brain, which cause your executive function to fail. You can't think. You can't strategize. And you're utterly confused. And so that is another big part of the glue. The intermittent abuse causes the bond. Now we're at the glue. Mm. Cognitive dissonance. Mm. And then everything that happens within that, do they start to play on like more of your emotions with the shame and the guilt of if you leave? Or um, in fact, in your book, you talk about because you're just to give people a very quick Fast forward and then we're going to rewind. Yeah. You're now a psychotherapist yes. who now has clients yes. that help women get through this. Yes. Oh, my God. What an amazing ending. So in the book, you talk, um, one of your, uh, your clients is called Juno. Yes. And you talk about a story where she was trying to be attractive to her husband. 
Okay. And she, because they were having a fight or something. Yes. And so she was trying to, maybe if I can make the peace, I, let, me, let me try something on him. He rejects her. They fight about it. And she feels so much shame and guilt when she calls the cops. Yes. That she then doesn't actually say the truth. Correct. Talk to me about that. Tell me the story. And then why we women feel so much shame, even when we're like being abused. They get into a tussle, right? And so when the police come, instead of saying that her husband was abusive, she protects him. But he ends up saying she was abusive and she ends up getting arrested. And that's the danger here, right? Because if you're dealing with someone who's selfish and entitled and only thinks about themselves, you know, they're going to throw you under the bus like she got thrown under the bus. And that's a very true story. She did end up in jail. She's doing okay now. But yeah, she had lost herself so much that she forgot that she mattered in the world and she made him matter more and she protected him. And then he got her in a lot of trouble. And, the, and I write about this in the book too, and it's really important is that I write about personality traits, right? And so some people, like I am one of them, I score very high in agreeableness. So that means I'm loyal, I'm tolerant, I'm altruistic, I'm very relational. Relationships are everything to me, hence why I'm a therapist, right? Those are all really nice qualities, but not in the hands of the wrong person. They get weaponized. And so even more than calling somebody a people pleaser, it's calling them a pro-social individual. Whoa, social individual. Interesting. Right? Like they want, they mm. love relationships. They mm. value them. And so that, but that in the hands of the wrong person can get you into a lot of trouble. Now, you and I have become friends and you're going to cherish those qualities. You're going to respect them. You're going to admire them, but not with a pathological person. They will exploit them. Another big quality about a pathological person is they're always the victim. So what do you, do you call that victim signaling? Yes. So he's now her victim, right? which couldn't have been any further from the truth. He was cheating on her. He was lying to her. He was abusing her. He was calling her terrible, horrible names, fat, ugly, this and that. Yeah, so, but then what they do is they victim signal and they pretend to be the victim because they know that it elicits empathy in other people mm -hmm. or in us. What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. But then also though, the victim part of it is almost like their get out of jail free card, right? Where they're yes. like, well, you made me do this because you treated me like this. That's right. And there's a story about the, the woman whose husband was naked with another woman, takes a photograph oh, yes. and then sends it to her and says, you made me do this. Yes. What did she do? You would think if you're not in that relationship, right? And you haven't got that hook. You haven't had that history. Anyone listening would be like, fuck him, right? <laughs> right? And you would yes. bounce. You would like yes. disconnect. You would never speak to him again. Right. But what did she do actually? Well, you know, and then we get into the complexity of it, right? She's financially dependent upon him. She has two children, right? She has a sick mother that she's managing, right? So maybe she's not being her sexiest self at the time, which we know happens in life. So then, you know, she's no longer with him, <laughs> you know, happy to say that. But yeah, you... I just sit there and hold space for the grief and the sadness and without judgment and give them this, give her the space to feel what she needs to feel. And then, okay, how do we handle that? You know, how do we get you strong enough and resource you enough so that you, so that she did feel the strength to leave him eventually? Mm. Yeah. And it's never my place to say when, you know, but I always say to myself, my poor therapist, I went to her every single Monday at 1 p.m. for seven years mm -hmm. and she listened to me. So if she could listen to me, 
through my first marriage and I can listen. Yeah. I've actually heard, heard you say actually, that um, certain therapists can also gaslight you. Yes. Talk to me about that because in these moments yeah. where maybe something we're saying right now is triggering someone to say, okay, maybe I do need therapy to help get out of this relationship. Yes. Um, sometimes we end up going to the wrong person that gives us the wrong advice that actually ends up being worse for us. Therapists are people too. They bring their own biases into the room, their own histories. And, you know, it does sound incredulous. I mean, like, how could that person stay based upon that story, right? Like you made me do this laying on top of another woman naked. But the woman already feels so much shame and self-blame and judgment. And when therapists say, you know, I can't believe you stayed, like, why are you staying? It takes four to seven times for a woman to attempt leaving, usually to leave a trauma bond. And there can just be little microaggressions in the way a therapist speaks to somebody about that. And then, you know, hopefully people leave because they trust their gut again and just feel like, wait, this doesn't feel safe. Mm. Because, again, often when a woman does leave can be the most dangerous time. So you have to be really prepared emotionally, physically, financially to do that. Yeah, because when you, I guess, had said that you were going to leave, he threatened you, correct? Oh, yeah. He did more than threaten me. Yeah. Uh, what, what happened is I had said to him, you have to get sober. I'm not going to sit here and just watch you kill yourself anymore. This is insanity. And that's when he took my jewelry and clothing and threw them in the fireplace and lit them on fire. Yeah. And got very just verbally abusive and mean. And um, I actually left because I needed to come up with a plan. And I went to my mother's. My children were totally safe. With uh, my housekeeper at the time, I knew that they were completely safe. And when I came back is when he got violent with me and kicked me down the stairs. Yeah, so that once you really stand up to somebody like this and threaten them, not, not threaten them, but really speak your truth and use your voice and say you're going to leave, da, 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 that can really, I mean... I didn't know back then I probably shouldn't have done it when he was on drugs. Mm. So that's my first piece of advice. Don't ever tell someone you're leaving them at that moment. But he was actually taking my daughter, so I had to chase him. And didn't he say you're only going to leave here in a body bag? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that in intimidating, dominating, threatening. We call them scorched earth statements. Mm. These Scor big, grandiose statements. Have you heard the phrase, I mean, I had this growing up, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt. Have yes. you heard that phrase? Yes. I think that set us all up for utter disaster because I think we dismiss the words, we dismiss the language as being um, dangerous. Yeah. And even in your book, you write about one of your clients that wished that they had gotten hit. Yes. So that they had a concrete reason to leave. Correct. Emotional and verbal abuse, right, and manipulation or betrayal, they cause so much pain that nobody can see. They cause so much pain that nobody can see. So then people look at you and you're like, oh, you're fine. You're out grocery shopping. You're doing this. You're doing that. But inside you feel like you're dying. Because, of, you know, you think about coercive control. So at the end of a trauma bond, it's all about control, right? So you have the dominating, intimidating, threatening piece of it, the isolating piece of it. And then in the other column, you have the belittling, the degrading, the gaslighting, the, psych um, the manipulation, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going against a lot of different things. And that's really why I name them and educate people so that they know that this is what's happening to them. Because when you're in it and somebody let's say, cheats on you and you catch them and they say, no, 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 that was my friend. He was emailing her. I was doing it for my friend. That don't, don't pay attention to that. That's a lie. It's gaslighting. And you need to know that that's, somebody's doing that to you. But did anybody ever, when, as you were leaving him, was anybody like, oh, you shouldn't leave him? Were they trying to, did they understand? I think at that point, everybody, <laughs> Because yeah. it was so extreme. Yes. Because our experience was so extreme, but um, I could understand for other people, because a lot of times coercive control and abuse really happens at home. It doesn't happen, especially if you're dealing with 
a grandiose narcissist who cares about their image and wants to present a good image. I mean, so many of my patients' husbands are big public figures in their community. So they act very nice in public. And then when somebody says, I'm leaving, they're like, why? Didn't you get accused of leaving him because he had eventually, because uh, he obviously had to go to prison? Yes. Yeah, that's a real pet peeve of mine. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> that's a real pet peeve of mine because people will say, oh, you left him because he lost all his money. And, and it's like, no, I left him because I was abused and he got an ankle bracelet on and I knew I was safe. Mm. That's why I picked that moment to leave because I knew I could do it because now he was the government's problem. What do you, <laughs> in all honesty, though, that probably made it a little easier for you? Yes. So how would you suggest other people that may be listening right now that maybe obviously it's not that extreme yes. and that I really hope they don't freaking wait to get kicked down the stairs yes, like you? Yes, like what are yes. the things that people can start to um, identify actually firstly that this really is truly either narcissism or toxic, like clinical versus like they're having a bad year because the stocks are down yeah, and, yeah. you know, like what? I think a pattern of behavior. Right. And I do agree with you. I think I always say this to my patients. It was almost easier for me because it was so extreme. And when it's more subtle, I do agree with you with that. It's a pattern of behavior of, you know, understanding what intermittent abuse is and then recognizing it. And I have a pathological lover checklist in my book. <laughs> right? Does he monopolize your time? Right. Do actions not match words? The boundary stuff that we talked about, substance abuse. How does he talk about his mother? I mean, all of these things you can literally read and see, okay, is this happening? But really a pattern of behavior that the behaviors that we're talking about, if they don't go away, I mean, a huge thing is that we all have fights in relationships, right? We know we, mm -hmm. we're in marriages long, long time. But in this sort of relationship, there's crazy making communication that never goes anywhere. Mm -hmm. You never feel resolution. The person never takes accountability. Or when they do do something wrong, they're going to change. They're going to go to therapy. They're going to go to their spiritual counselor. They're going to do this. And they don't change. And the patterns of behavior that we're mentioning just keep going on. And they usually will escalate. Did you hope that Jordan would change? Was that part of why you stayed with him sure. for a long time? Yeah. And for us too, it was a little tricky because of the drug addiction. So I really thought that if the drug addiction was gone. So you're like, it's not him, it's it, the drugs. Yes. Yes. And how much of that do you think we in general make reasonings for people's behaviors to excuse them? Even if it's a potential excuse for them, yeah. you do it so that you can then move to on. Rationalize. To rationalize. To yeah. rationalize. Thank you. Sure, sure. Because I was a young girl and I had children and I really did fall in love and I did want it to work. So I'd be like, oh, you know, if I wear purple, he'll change. If I do this, he'll change. If I do that, he'll change. But no, the only person we can control is ourselves. And I thought love would make him change. Right. But no, he wasn't changing and it was escalating. And I think I was so sucked in at that moment, you know, that I couldn't see the forest through the trees. Mm. And so once you finally were separated, you finally yes. left. Yes. Talk to me about the evolution then of your own self, how you then started to show up in the world differently and yeah. then how you went from that relationship to who you are now where you help other women um, yeah. really yeah. in these situations. So when I, you know, when I first left, um, I went to like a, a healing clinic for a week because I realized my life was way out of control and I needed help. And so I think that the really the most important first step you can do when you're in a relationship like that is we're so focused on the other. We're just so focused on our partner is to turn the mirror back and start to get, I got really curious about myself. How am I wired for love? What, are my, what was my attachment pattern? Um, who am I really at my core? I didn't know how to set boundaries. I didn't know it was a full sentence. I got, so I got really educated psychologically about myself and relationships because 
I am a meaning making individual. And I just was like, I need to learn. So I never do this again. For years, I always felt shame and guilt and especially because of the arrest. And it was also shameful. So I think I can, I could hold both that I was managing my shame and also learning about myself. And again, because I'm optimistic, right? I have that hopeful temperament. And I, I just, and I had two little kids. So I swore to myself that they were going to have a great life, no matter what. They're, that's, you know, mother's love is very motivating. Mm -hmm. So even for people that can't do it for themselves. And I find that with a lot of women I work with. So how do you, like, if let's say you're younger and you don't have kids and you're, let's say, in your yeah. mid-20s and um, you've luckily got out early. Yeah. Um, you don't have that kids like because I don't have kids, so right. I'm always so trying to find not... ways. Like I wish I had kids as my motivation. Yeah. Sometimes it makes it again. Sometimes it makes it easier, right? And you know, a lot of people talk about self love, but I always talk about self acceptance, mm. right? And simply having radical acceptance about what you went through, and being willing to look at it and learn and grow and surround yourself with like minded individuals and get yourself into therapy into good therapists. And also, you know, what do you want to do with your life, right? Because you lose your sense of self in this relationship. So how do you want to live your life? Do you want to work? Do you want to do charity work? Do you want to go back to school? You know, what do you want to do? I took my children and moved across the country <laughs> because I did not want them to deal with that legacy. Mm -hmm. Um, little did I know there'd be a movie made, but you know, the best like, laid the biggest plans. blockbuster in the world <laughs> ever. Yeah. So we moved across the country mm. and started over and I had a career at the time. I was a garment manufacturer. So I think I also had that to hold on to and to build my confidence back up because when, when you get traumatized in a relationship, a lot of times you want to avoid life. Tra the number one response to trauma is avoidance. So I always say to my patients, we got to approach. I know you want to avoid, but even you, you could just approach a little thing today. And I had to have really good self-care because self-care stabilized me after all the trauma. What was I eating? You know, not drinking, right? Like exercising, eating well, going to therapy, meditating, all those things to, to you have to resource yourself to move forward. And I remember so many days feeling so despondent and just saying to myself, Nadine, faith the size of a mustard seed can move a mountain. Mm -hmm. And I would just say that to myself over and over again. So like having a mantra that really gets you going when you feel hopeless and shame and depressed, because that's a normal response to being in a trauma bond. But I had, that was my mantra, or I would say, I believe, I believe it's silly, but I believe. And I had these things that I would go back to, to say to myself, because how I spoke to myself or how we speak to ourselves is so important. If you tell yourself, forget it, this is the end of your life. You're never going to get better. Your life is shit. You know, you're not going to get better. <laughs> you have to be your own self-soother, self-cheerleader, self-love, you know, like be really kind to yourself. I love that you also said, like, it felt a little silly, but you still kind of do it in a way. Yeah. Um, and that's so powerful. And I really want people to hear yes. that because I did that with my Wonder Woman necklace that I have on. Oh, I love so that. I was I, wondering what that was. Yeah, so I was trying to build my confidence. Yeah. And I was like, okay, what do I, I don't feel confident. What do I know about habits and confidence and things like that? What yeah. you tell yourself, you start to believe. Yes. Number one, habits take 30 days. Number yes, two. Yes. Okay. So how do I just repeat a mantra to your point that's yeah. super easy for me to do yeah. that I can do over and over and over again. And I felt so silly, but I would put this Wonder Woman necklace I on. I love it. And I got it from Amazon. And every day I would look in the mirror and I would say, you're a badass like Wonder Woman. Every time I would put it on, I felt so bloody silly, right? Because it's like, it's a necklace and I'm not Wonder Woman. She, she's fiction. But I was like, no, you no. can't let your mind get yes. there. Lisa, you, you stare yourself in the mirror. Yes. And every time you put that on, you tell yourself you're a badass like Wonder Woman. Did you, know, did you know that there's research on that? No. <laughs> Please actually yes. tell me about the yes. research. So, so there's research because um, how you speak to yourself is also about having self-compassion, which I write about. Mm -hmm. And the, the research talks about that if you're self-compassionate towards yourself specifically in the mirror, mm -hmm. it's more effective saying, 
I know this is hard. I've suffered. The world suffers. But let me speak to myself as I would a good friend. But yeah, there's research to do it in the mirror. Mm, It's so powerful. I'm definitely a fan of the research because... (laughs) And that's why I love that you said, look, it feels a bit silly, but sometimes you have to do it. And don't you think that that becomes then almost a commitment to heal? Like if you're not committed to trying to get past it or or grow from it, then you're not going to be able to. Yeah. And if you think about it, when you're in a trauma bond or a bad relationship, you Mm self-abandon. Okay. So it's all about self-abandonment. So what's the opposite? Self-commitment. Commitment to yourself showing up for yourself every single day, whatever it takes when you don't want to. Nobody hates going to a workout class when they leave. They hate it when they got to go, myself included, by the way. Mm. Okay, I got to move these 56-year-old bones, but I do it, right? Because you feel good about yourself because you're committed to you. Mm. And that's true. How do you, though, heal if you're constantly reminded of everything that's happened you know, your triggers are kind of always coming yes. up. Like having this movie yes. released with the most famous man in the world, Leonardo DiCaprio, <laughs> right. the most yeah. famous director in the world, Martin Scorsese. Yeah. I mean, it's got Matthew McConaughey. I mean, it's it's so freaking big. It is like half a billion dollars in yeah, revenue. I know, it's crazy. Martin Scorsese's biggest movie ever from a <laughs> revenue standpoint. How the hell do you heal when... People bring it up like myself, <laughs> yeah. um, or especially because it's been out for 10 years yeah. now. Um, how do you keep progressing? Because because you're extreme in how you've had to evolve and where you've come from and where you yeah. are now, I think if you can do it, homie, then everybody, everybody else has else. that can yes. as well. Yes, they can. Yeah, you know, I mean, well, I talk a lot about triggers, you know, too, in my book. And actually, when the movie was coming out, I kind of had this talk with myself as I do, because I was furious. I had so many emotions about it, but I didn't shame myself over my emotions. I gave myself the space to have my emotions. I didn't judge them. And so when you process your emotions and speak about them, you can release them. And then you're not triggered as much because the emotions aren't held in here tightly, just waiting to get picked at. And so I processed it ad nauseum. And I, and I just, that's, that's really what I did. And I just, I didn't deny that it was happening. So I dealt with it, but then I surrendered. And I said, this is bigger than me. And I don't know where this is going to take me. What the hell's going to happen from this? I had no idea, you know? And so that combination, I think of like doing the work, whatever your work is, whatever feels right for you, things we've spoken about, and also surrendering. Hmm. How do you surrender? Like it's, I love it, but what are the acts of surrendering? Yeah, so so for me, what I did was that, again, I would talk to myself and just not fight it. Mm. You know, people like, are you going to sue him? Are you going to get a lawyer? Are you going to, you know, make money from this? Are you, there was, and I just was like, no, I'm going to trust this process. As crazy as this seems and as horrible as this must appear, because I don't want to live through this Greek tragedy again for everybody's entertainment, you know? But I just was like, Nadine, there's nothing you can do. There's, this is out of your control, and you have to let this go. And it, again, it's a constant internal conversation and external conversation. And, you know, validating, this is hard, and there's nothing you can do. You need to let it go. Wow, homie, that's so strong. (laughs) Um, I've also heard you say that because there's certain scenes that aren't 100% accurate. So he makes you look super jealous all the time. And I've heard you say that you're not jealous at all. Um, And then I've heard you say the movie was the ultimate gaslighting. Yes. So so you hear it's coming out. You do all that work that you said. You surrender. I think that's freaking beautiful. It comes out. Talk to me about you went and watched it with your son and Jordan. Yes, 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 yes. So I first got to see a private screening of it at Paramount with my husband. And I remember sitting down and being like, okay, this is so surreal. Um, Then I looked at my husband when it was over. I go, not that bad. Not that bad, right? I just look like a young woman who loved her kids, who was running around chasing, trying to control a crazy person, which was true. And then Jordan, you know, which I really appreciated him. He goes, we should take our son Carter because there's a lot of sex scenes in the movie. 
And so, yeah, we I made a decision to take him there. Again, right, approaching, facing mm. it, not denying it, right, not avoiding it. Like, this is here visiting now. I must deal with this. Of course, I'm going to protect my son. And I talk about this where some, like, horrific sexual scene, of course, and I push his head down. He's like, Mom, it's not you. I could do it. I could watch it. He's like, it's true, but you're still saying things that mom did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, so, I mean, but again, like approaching, mm. right, facing life, not crawling under the covers. I mean, listen, when Jordan wrote the book and he let me read it for the first time, I, I mean, through a hissy fit, called him up, yelled at him, threw myself in bed, you know, like <laughs> for two hours. And my husband comes up, he's like, you're going to get up? So again, giving yourself the space to feel getting up, approaching. And then, you know, I think that me always going back to now connecting to my authentic self is the best thing that I want to share with everybody. It's like going back to the body and going back to the emotions and just letting them kind of guide me. Mm. Not always listening to this ego brain because when you don't listen to yourself and you don't give voice to your truth, whatever that is, every time you do that, you diminish yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just not a healthy, it's an easy place to fall into. I've been there many days, but when you connect your authentic self and your emotions and you give voice to them, the opposite of depression isn't happiness, it's vitality. Love that. Right? So when you connect yourself and you give voice to your emotions, the good, the ugly, the bad, and you approach life and you take risks, right? Then you feel alive. And then the more you do that, the more you want to do it. Mm -hmm. It's so amazing. But in those moments, because you said, you know, I even, I even go there a lot yeah. myself in the past. When you're there, even if you've been able to get yourself out of it, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes you said it's easy to fall there. I think yeah. the ones that really, really freaking thrive are the ones that can get back up yeah. time and time, time again. again. So how, what does that getting up look like for you? Yeah. I built my confidence by approaching what I feared. So when those moments do come up, because they always come up where I feel insecure or not enough or, oh shit, what's going to happen? But then I'm like, oh, but I've done something good. Mm. I got up today or I faced that or it wasn't as bad as I thought, right? So, but in between the times that you feel horrible, because we all have them, building that confidence. And I say to my patients, you can't buy confidence at the store. You have to have the courage to face your fears. I wish I could say, I'll take confidence I today. Know, I'll take a bucket. I'm going to Costco. I'm getting the biggest <laughs> job I have. <laughs> right? So, but that's and where there's fear, there's transformation. Mm. So yes, you might feel afraid, you might feel despondent, you might feel shame, you might feel hopeless. Give yourself the space to feel those. Get back up, approach what you fear. You build confidence. Big waves are going to come in life anyway, but now you've built some real true internal confidence to manage them. Yeah. I love that because the confidence part for me also though is you it's a, it's like a muscle. Yes. You build exactly. it. Exactly. But if you stop using it, mm -hmm. it will start to atrophy. Yeah, what a beautiful way to say it. Correct. And, and I think that that's why relationships are so important, that I do so many relationship episodes on this, you know, on yeah. my show, because it isn't that I only want to talk about relationships, but I just know how much relationship yes. can ruin that confidence that maybe you've spent months Correct. and months or years and years building. Correct. And it can knock so many women's confidence that they never get back up. That they don't. Yes, yes. But I'm here to tell you, you can. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm living proof that you can. Yeah, you are. Right? And that actually it something interesting happens is that if you do keep building your confidence on your own through ever, however you do it, through whatever ways in the outer world, if your partner still behaves the way that they do, they get to a point where they can't knock you down anymore. Mm -hmm. And life just goes on. Because as your confidence builds true, you know, deep confidence, their tactics, their manipulations, they don't sting as much. Because you're like, that's more about you. Because I'm really now in touch with who I am. I know who I am. I've worked hard to be this person. 
you know, at 22, I had barely lived. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's so true. And is that what had helped you then once the movie came out? Yes. Exactly. You deal with it? Exactly. Because, I mean, you know, when I was becoming a therapist, it's nerve wracking a lot of times because to do clinical hours, you have to perform therapy in front of your class. Oh, yeah. And I would be vomiting before. I'd be so nervous. Like, Nadine, you can do it. You can do it. And then I do it and it worked out fine, right? And so I had been doing a lot of that by the time the movie came out. I think I was getting my PhD. And so I'd been through my master's. And so I felt much more confident because mm. I had faced so many fears. So yeah. doing that kind of foundation work. And I think that that's where it, uh, the worst happens when it happens to us when we're young, because we haven't built that foundation yes, yet. Yes, 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 yes. You know, whereas I think a lot of people, if they can build that foundation first, if they end up getting or Correct. meeting somebody that becomes Correct. either manipulator, narcissist, gaslighting, all of the yes. you know things that we've been talking about. You, to your point, you can already identify and now you just don't go down that path in That's the first right. place. That's right. That's right. Because you, you, you know not to self-abandon because especially if you've worked hard to build this, these internal resources inside of mm -hmm. you, like confidence and true self-esteem, you know, you, you don't want to leave them. No. You, uh, right? You don't. You know. Hold on tight. You, yeah, you hold on tight. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, so that I think it gets harder for that relationship to take you down. But especially when you're younger, that is the great time to go in and focus on you. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why I was asking these, these uh, questions about confidence specifically is I have noticed so much of my audience have lost their confidence after they've been in a toxic relationship. For sure. And they don't they don't actually believe they can get it back. And so sadly, some people respond in, well, I'm never going to, I'm never going to give myself over to anyone again. And that way I will never get trapped again. Oh, yes, I understand that. But you obviously were able to, and now you've been in such a beautiful marriage for so yeah. long, like double the time you've been with Jordan. Yeah. Do you feel like it was that inner work that allowed you to then find somebody that deserved you? Yes, I do think it was the inner work. And I think what happens is when your trust has been so broken, there's a big fear about who you can trust. But I think it's also more about learning to trust yourself to make that decision for the person, mm -hmm. you know, for the right person. How did you feel then about him being so glorified? Yeah. Um, and I'm going to be very honest. When I watched the movie, I was like, oh, he looks kind of cool. Yeah, sure. Like I even said earlier, it's like, I kind of want to hang out with him for a day. But that's also as a female who sees another female go through that, that's horrifying. So I'm, I'm very conflicted because, and maybe it's just society. They use the tools of entertainment, fame, yeah. Yeah. bigger than life movies, bigger than life actors. And, yeah. and so if I was drawn to that, God, People don't stand a chance in your everyday life with necessarily, you know, your average guy. But how did you feel about that? Like, how did you process that? And how do yeah. you feel about that now that it, Leonardo DiCaprio, who obviously plays him, that role is so glorified and the movie has been glorified. You know, I think it speaks more to our society than anything else, you know, of glorifying money and power or an abuse of power and charisma and charm and greed and all that sort of stuff. So, I mean, honestly, I'm okay with it. You know, at first it was annoying, of course, when you, again, when you first hear things and, but it's his story. It was his book. It's his narrative. You know, I could expect with his personality, he's going to write himself like that. So you just predicted it. <laughs> yeah. I'm, just, I'm not really surprised about it. Because he is a larger than life individual. And Jordan wrote the book in a very humorous way. And I always say that it wasn't very humorous. Right. Yeah. yeah, it was not. It's no, it's very, it's very tragic. But I understand how, like you're saying, you can get drawn because that personality is very magnetic. It does pull us in. And also, I think we get very fascinated by the shadow side of life. Mm, go on. Yeah, where, which he really embodies that um, with his corruptness and his drug addiction and his just total debauchery. It's fascinating, right, to see that a person could live like that. And so I think we become a voyeur or the viewer becomes a voyeur into that. 
but it's definitely not a way to live. <laughs> you are so optimistic. The, yeah. You are so lighthearted. When I hear you talk about Jordan, it's never like, that fucker, he's an arsehole. It's always with kindness and yeah. respect almost. Well, you know, he's a father of my children and and he's still a person on the planet. And I did choose to marry him, right? So I don't really think it behooves me to bash him. I mean, I'm, and that's how I do with my children too, with him, you know, I'll be factual, but disparagement, I just don't think really gets me anywhere. And it's just not part of who I am. That doesn't mean, trust me, Lisa, I haven't had moments where I like, I want to fucking kill that guy. <laughs> okay. So let's like, that doesn't mean I don't have those moments. And, I, but again, I express them, I get them out. And they're over, you know, and now it has been a long time. So, but so many people, like so many people in your position yeah. would be the polar opposite. And here's the thing. I think that you're a much happier being. I think yeah. that you're living your true life yeah. that allows you to flourish, that allows you to blossom. Yes. And so I'm trying to, the people that yes. don't act like that, the people that do disparage. And I get it, right? Like there's that part of you is like, they've done me wrong, so I'm yes. going to talk badly about them. But, but that, that keeps you stuck. Right. That keeps you stuck. And you know what I always say? I'm, he doesn't live in your house anymore. Don't let him live in your head. Okay. If I am focusing on him, I might as well have stayed married. If I'm still focusing on him, being angry at him, that's what I was like when I was married to him, right? So once I let go of that... And I was able to focus on me, it, the whole thing internally dynamically changed. And then, I mean, living well is the best revenge. <laughs> you know, living my dream and now getting to help women everywhere and to make meaning out of all of it. I mean, I couldn't have written it better if I tried. <laughs> so it's just, it's just, I don't know, in the end, and I, I say that, and, and I don't mean to have toxic positivity because that's nothing that I'm about, but there really was uh, some wisdom or some beauty that came of that horrible thing that I get to sit here today with you on this couch and offer all of my education and experience to women to help them, right? So I guess that's why I just don't have the anger. That's so powerful. Perspective is everything. Like I literally live by this motto. Um, everything bad that's ever happened to me, obviously I've never been to this extreme, so I never want to, you know, pretend, but anything bad that's ever happened to me in my life from like, let's say seven years ago on, yeah. as soon as it happens, the like I'm on my knees, girl, I'm on my oh, knees, yeah. I'm feeling broken. And in that moment, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. it's ever happened to me. Okay, Lisa, you can yes. have a memory. And through the tears, I just yes. repeat that. And yeah, I'm like, beautiful. everything that you do is a future memory. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Period. So now if you know everything you do becomes a future memory, mm -hmm. how do I want to remember this moment? What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank. One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. That's right, and that's right. And you can look at it, you know, we always have a choice, right? And Viktor Frankl wrote about mm -hmm. that, right? A man's search for meaning, right? We're Things are always going to happen to us in life and trauma is real and it's painful and it can stop you in your tracks. But then once you do regroup, you do have a choice. And we live in a world now where you have this beautiful show and we do have a lot more resources, right? To grow, to heal, to get better and become our best selves. Yeah. And so for people who don't know, he was in a concentration camp. That's right. He was so in a concentration for camp. for him to yes. be able to say that, yes. I think is super impactful for everybody else because then, you know, I think we either diminish what we've been through and be like, ah, oh, it's not that bad. Because yes. well, didn't actually Jordan even say that to you? It wasn't that bad. Oh, yeah, that was, that was the knife. That was the knife. That was what made me fall out of love with him. Really? Yeah. Because the lack of 
acknowledgement of the pain that I had gone through, that I had endured when I expressed it to him. And he goes, it wasn't that bad. And that, I didn't know what the word callous was back then. But inside of me, again, my gut went, oh my God, I could never love this person. How could he deny what I endured? So the abuse is hard, but it's the denial and the lack of accountability that's the... That's what I almost mean by the movie as well, is that it doesn't yeah. really echo the true... No, doesn't. What you've been through. No, like no, if no. we were to remake the movie from yeah, your I mean, perspective, it's a freaking thriller, horror movie. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's it would don't be, let the kids watch this. It's, yeah, yeah. It would be very different. It would be very different. But again, I guess I was just, you know, in a place where I was confident and happy with my own life. And, and because I'm optimistic and my temperament, it just, and, and again, that didn't mean there weren't hard times. Ooh, but now look what I get to do. And women will come to me and say, wait, you went through this and came out like this. You give me hope. I want to come to you. That gives me hope that my life doesn't have to stay like this forever, where I feel so broken and feel, filled with shame. I don't really believe that everything happens for a reason, but I think right. that you can make meaning out of what's happened and it's yes. up to you what meaning you make of it. Either That's it becomes right. a positive thing or a negative thing. And so for you to be able to spin this around and really make it your life's mission yeah. and go from, you know, a, a life that is just, when I watch the movie again like heartbreaking for you that you've had to endure that like as a yeah, woman right like right heartbreaking for you but for you to be able to come out and stand so powerful I really want people to hear like you don't do you consider yourself a victim no no I, I use the term sir thriver so thriving, <laughs> right? So we mix survive and so thriving. No, you need to coin that, by the way. Yeah. You need to like trademark that shit. <laughs> yeah, no, I, d I don't. I mean, I, you know, I was certainly a victim in the past by what I endured, you mm. know, but not anymore. Not anymore. Again, that just that self-acceptance, that warm, fuzzy feeling inside. You know, we bring our little inner girls with us. Mm. Right. And so I can say to her, we did it. We did it, you know, mm -hmm. as a 56-year-old woman. And watching my daughter, who's a therapist, like she just had a baby, and watching her family be healthy. Mm -hmm. Because I always say, we, we, you know, that's evolution, right? I'm more evolved version of my mother. She's a much more evolved version of me, my daughter. Her child's will be. And that's what we hope for. Is that like generational trauma that sometimes yeah. get, can get passed? But it can but be breaking good. Breaking the cycle. Yeah, mm -hmm. it can be good. Right? right? It can be a good legacy. To see how you've come through yes. it. And then, yeah. Yes. Right? So now you're not just affecting your life. You're affecting the people you love, the people you impact. Isn't that the name of the show? Yeah. <laughs> Women of Impact, baby. <laughs> That's right. Um, so how have you taken everything we've been speaking about yeah. and putting that into your new marriage? Mm. Because I think that that also becomes that next step of not only do I want to build my confidence back, not only do I want to believe that I can not only heal, but I can thrive and I can really be that person. But it is, and I really want to find someone that yeah. deserves me. So yeah. what, when you started to, when you met your, your yeah. husband, what were the things and lessons that you took from your relationship with Jordan as signs and flags that when you met the right person, yeah. you knew? Yeah, green flags. We can yeah, have green, green flags. flags. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of, that's nice. So um, first of all, I was going to honor my boundaries. And if he like tried to push my boundaries or plow through them, I knew that that would be a bad sign. And the first time we had a, an argument, because they happen, he was like, oh yeah, I hear that. And I was like, what? I, oh, I thought I was going to fall off my chair. I had not been heard for so long. And I have a saying that if someone can't hear you, they can't love you. And he heard me and he listened and he gave me space to be me. And that was, that was a game changer. Something as simple as that. He respected my boundaries. He, he just, he, he saw me. I, he had empathy towards me. He wasn't callous. If he did something wrong, he took accountability. 
he would say, yeah, I could see that that was not an appropriate way to behave, like to push you to do that. Mm. You know, that, that you're right. So, and there was, there wasn't crazy making communication. We could have an argument. We didn't always agree, but there would be some sort of resolution that, and we could feel reconnected again. I wasn't resenting him. With Jordan, I swam in a reservoir of resentment because I couldn't be me. But there was, there was just, we actually had resolution because all relationships have rupture and repair. Right. And then when you have, when you're with somebody that can hear you and feel you and see you and you have the repair after the rupture, the intimacy deepens. Mm. Life goes on. We have another rupture, have a repair. It deepens. But yet you didn't have the repair part is with Jordan? Is no, it? we never had repair. It was just rupture, 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 rupture that then ends up leaving. Yeah. The... Yeah. There was no repair. So no. And then we both love to cook. <laughs> we both love pizza. <laughs> he had three kids. I had two kids. We were all about family. And um, we just work on it. We still work on it. And all of that was made possible, I assume, by you building that foundation after you let yes, left Jordan. Yes. Because the thing that I hear a lot um, is that people go into the next cycle with somebody else. So it becomes they have a certain behavior. They... Um, you know, sadly get enmeshed with somebody who's very toxic. Yeah. They then finally are able to, you know, leave. Okay. And then they end up in the same relationship, just a different person right. with a different name. Right. And that's why you have to understand your attachment patterns, how you're wired for love, right? You really need to understand yourself and really don't date for a year. I mean, some experts say two. I think that's a lot to ask somebody to not <laughs> date for two years. So I'm a little bit more lenient. And again, it's their lives, but for a year, get to know yourself, get to understand yourself. How are you wired for love? You know, what can you change about yourself? What are you interested in? So that when you do meet somebody, you have the confidence to have a voice, say what you want, say what you need, right? Be vulnerable with them. But that all just takes work. I mean, you know, we're a work in progress. We should just be wearing construction hats all day long. <laughs> That's so funny. That's right? Really the work never ends. I'm 56. Yeah. But I kind of like now not, not knowing that the work never ends. Yes. And in telling myself that I never seek the finish line. Right. 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 And also I give myself a lot of grace. You know, I screw up all the time and I'm like, you know what, Nadine, tomorrow you'll do better. Mm. Tomorrow you'll do better. You know, not every day you're going to feel great. You're going to be top of your game. You're going to say the wrong thing to people, make mistakes at work. And I, you know, and I recognize that mistakes, failure, rejection, they're a part of life. Right? What's your biggest hope that people take away from your book? Oh, God, that's a loaded question. You know, that it's not their fault. One of the things is that if you've been in an abusive relationship, a trauma bond, that it's not your fault. Abuse is always the fault of the pathological person. It's nothing you did it, you, or, or weren't or didn't do, or it's just not your fault. And that, and that you don't have to stay in this forever. There's so much hope afterwards and to run like hell. Yeah, buddy. Run right. Like to hell. run like hell and to know that you're worthy of love and that there's somebody out there if that's what you want or, you know, just go and build yourself. But what I really want to do is educate women in a scholarly academic way, but, you know, entertained with stories like we spoke about so that they can be empowered to reach their potential in life and love. Because that's just what I want for everybody. And everybody, that's their birthright. And it's possible. That's the best part. This isn't some like wish. It's possible. You're living proof. Yeah. Where can people find you and just all the amazing, I mean, honestly, you are really helping so many women. So yeah. where can people find everything that you're doing? So they can go to my website, drnae.com, or they can see me on Instagram at the real Dr. Nadine. And they can also find me on TikTok, which is the wild west of social media. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Nay, and again, N-A-E-L-M-F-T. And actually, um, in this month, I'm starting a community for women. Mm -hmm an online community, a trauma bond recovery group. 
not expensive, where they can go and connect with other women, get resources, um, take assessments. I'm going to do live webinars once a week. Mm -hmm. I can ask me anything. So to take the book and now expand it into real time, helping women everywhere. If you want to learn how to outsmart a narcissist and finally take your power back, then keep watching. One of the things that I do suggest is I say fluff or favor vomit later. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> you know, I mean, use it to your advantage a little bit. So fluff up their ego, you know, like you're fluffing up a pillow. Yeah. And, you know, just throw lots and lots of compliments their way for the things that you want. And then, you know, get something that you want in return. Can you give me an example? Well, like, you know, if you want them to do the QuickBooks or something like that, you know, you're so much better at it and it'll be done so much more efficiently if you do it um, than if I would do it. And, uh, you know, but don't say anything about you being good at it or mm -hmm. anything like that. Don't have any kind of sar sarcastic tone or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Because I always say narcissists hear tones like dogs hear whistles. Like oh. even if there's no tone, like they hear tone, you know, I mean, like just something like that, you know, like if you want something, then ask them to do it like that, you know, because that way, you, you know, you'll get something mm -hmm. um, and then let them talk. A lot of times, you can find out what their, what do, how do you think that this should go? How do you think that this should be resolved? Let them talk about it, you know, kind of plant seeds and let them kind of come up with the ideas and, you know, don't take your ego out of it, you know, a lot of times because, if it at the end of the day ends up being resolved in the way that you wanted it to be resolved, but they think they came up with the idea, who cares? Yeah, I actually have a list of yours. So your, your Instagram's amazing, by the way. You have so many freaking tactical things. Um, and I pulled some from your, your Instagram on the ways to disarm them. Um, and so anyone at home listening, they can literally write these down and use them if they need to. I'm sorry you feel that way. Is that like allowing them to feel like they've been heard? Yes. Yes. So there's a lot of different ways that you can disarm them, you know, and, and I, I, I like agree. I agree with you, you know, because you can say, I agree with you. I agree with you that that's what you think. <laughs> you <know? laughs> that's hilarious. And they don't even realize what you're saying. They're just yeah. like, oh, well, great. You still agree with me. Yeah, I agree that that's your opinion, you know. I agree that's your opinion. It's so good. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, I, I can see that you are dot, 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 like that you are upset. Again, is that like allowing them to feel like they've been seen? Yes. Yeah. I can see that you are upset. I can see that you are angry. You know, just I like things that are observing of their behavior because mm. then you are starting to take yourself out of it and you are starting to see them as a third person you know, almost as an observing as a third party, because then you are starting to take it less personally, mm -hmm. because once you can start to not take things personally, you are starting to understand that it is their issue and not your issue. You know, people treat other people in a direct reflection of how they feel about themselves always. It never has anything to do with you. It always has to do with how they feel about themselves, good or bad. You know, if, if people treat other people well, it's because they feel good about themselves. Yeah, that's so true. Um, and then to pull up another one, um, that's an interesting perspective. Yes, it's an interesting perspective. Or I, 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 the other one I like is, oh, that's really great feedback. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. That's okay. <laughs> um, and then you also... I'll take that under advisement. <laughs> And then as we're going, because we're on the A for anticipation, there's another thing that you talk about, about how um, like the words actually would destroy them. And I think that this can be very, um, we can use this, I think this is very wise for us to talk through 
because I want people to anticipate if they use it. Because you even said about the tone, right? It's like, look, if you're sarcastic, it's just going to set them off. And so yeah. being able to anticipate how you talk about it also allows you again to take your power back. Because now in that, those moments, you just know what words to use to get what you want. Right. Yeah. I mean, and thinking that you're going to win and they're going to see that you're going to win is not happening. There's never going to be this idea that they're going to go, wow, you know, you're right. I totally get your side. I totally get your, that you are, to, I, I see your side now. They're not going to have this epiphany mm. and, and, and get to that other point and, and, and you feel all that closure and acknowledgement and uh, you know we, we talked about it before we started on the, the the four f's and you know forget about telling them they're a, nar they're a narcissist forget about closure forget about telling you know getting them to see that they're wrong and forget about getting them to see your side the four f's i mean because those things aren't happening you know i mean just move on mm -hmm. I think that's really useful though, because we do want to be validated. And when you've gone through so much crap, whether it's a relationship for personal or business, you find at the end like, oh, if I just get the closure now, I can move on. But if that isn't possible with somebody who is a narcissist, I think it's so it's it's very wise to just know that because now you're not wasting your energy. And now maybe you can find ways that you can get closure in other ways in your own validation, right? And yeah. moving on and working, you know, moving past that, um, really then building back your self-esteem. But if you're always holding on to, I just want them to say they're sorry. I just want this closure, you know, it, it can really keep you stuck. So I love those four Fs. They're so freaking powerful. Yeah, I mean, you just have to think of it in this way. A person cannot give you something that they don't have. You know, I, 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 re I remember reading a story that Wayne Dyer had, had said one time about like going to a fruit stand or something. And it's like asking for uh, like, I don't know, oranges or something. And then, oh, but they don't sell oranges at that fruit stand. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. asking for a person to give you oranges and they don't have them. Yeah. You know, like they just don't have the ability to give you that you know they just don't have it yeah they're a banana stand they're a banana stand <laughs> yeah they just don't have the ability to give you that because they don't they don't they feel empty inside so they're they, they can't even give themselves that kind mm -hmm. of acknowledgement or feeling of, of value so they're certainly not going to give it to you yeah and understanding that I think is really important again for you to be able to move on yeah um okay and so the words that you recommend do not say to a narcissist, or if you do it, they're just going to destroy them, yeah. the narcissist, and then there's, a, I assume, a big possibility of a lashback. Mm. Um, so you say, um, do not tell a narcissist, like, I'm disappointed in you, or it's your fault, or yeah. I'm busy, and I don't believe you, or goodbye. Yeah, I mean, you're not getting anywhere with that. I mean, and especially if you're trying to get to a resolution and you're trying to get... Mm out of this thing in a way that's, you know, um, to a place of resolution and be done, you know, be strategic. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Um, and so what words can you expect them to say to you as you start to navigate out of this, as you like, again, going back to the anticipation, um, because I think that it's important to, I don't want to say put the armor on, but maybe just have your shield that you can protect yourself um, mm. for when they come at you, that it doesn't just then break you. Yeah, I mean, you can expect them to say anything that they can to try to trigger you. I mean, so and, and depending on how well they know you, I mean, if they are, if they've been in a personal relationship with you and they know your Achilles heel, they're going to say the worst things that they possibly can. So you've got to just be prepared to go, wow, okay, that's interesting feedback. Never defend yourself. 
never explain, never justify, never overshare. I always say, talk to them like you're reporting the news, you know, as as little as possible. You don't need to defend yourself and, and go line by line by line. You know, you can just pick out the things you need to respond to and just respond to those. You know, I'm in receipt of your email. I will see you on Wednesday at three o'clock. But what if they do threaten like, so when it's a business, I actually can understand, right? Like, okay, you have to separate yourself, do it over email. But when it's something very personal, right? Let's say it's been a partner and they just know your vulnerabilities. They know your triggers, like the deep seeded wounds that you've had from childhood that you've maybe told one person in your life and it's them. And they come to you being like, hey, I'm going to use this. Like, you know, that thing that you don't want me to tell anyone, I'm going to tell the whole world. How do you work through that? How do you almost defend? I assume like you don't want to necessarily engage too much. But yeah, how would you handle that situation? I mean, that's why I say don't defend yourself, mm -hmm. because if you defend yourself, then they're going to be like, oh, I know they're I just I just because they want you to defend that. It's, it's a sign to them that you actually are very worried. Right. That they have still have the power over right. you. Right. Got it. Yeah. Oh, there's a thing. I found the thing. Yeah. They're going to run with that. And just remember that, you know, all that stuff, that's not trial exhibits. I mean, that's not, you know, those aren't things that they can, you know, if you, if you play into that, then, then they know they have you and now you're in it. Now you're in the mud. Now you're, the, now you're there, you know? I mean, so I would stay as brief as possible. Brevity is key because they hate that. I mean, you know, it's so funny. We used to have, you know, it, back when I was still practicing law, there was this attorney that I would, uh, you know, I was friends with and we all used to like laugh about him because he actually, you know, used to write entire, you know, people would write letters to him and then he would actually use a, a piece of stationery from his firm, dear so-and-so, no, and then sign his name to it. Like, <laughs> and, yeah, and it was so powerful, you yeah. know, to, to respond back that way. And like, it's so powerful to do that. Okay, but you actually said it's not a trial exhibit. Assume they have something on you and let's say like in court, right, where it's like, oh, now they've got this something of you, photo, email, something you've written, something that whatever, and they're going to put it in court, which even if it's not court, inside your head, let's say the court is your friends, your family, like they actually have the proof. How do you advise your clients? Because I'm sure they're just shit scared about this coming out, everyone's seeing it, the judge, the jury, their friends, everyone at home. Um, how do you talk them through not defending you know, if it does come out? I mean, what I would do if I, if I'm in court and I'm having to defend my client with something mm -hmm. like that, the way I would always handle that, what would be like, you know, you're going to, going to see this, da, 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 you know, and, um, I, I would right out of the gate, like handle it before they get to say anything about it. And then I would control that narrative, you know, so like my client one time, when I had a client who had slashed my my the, the wife's tires or something, and so I would say, you know, you're going to hear about how my client had slashed the wife's tires, and da 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 da. And so I had my client testify to it. What happened? Mm. You know, why did you do it? So it just completely took the the thunder away. Control the narrative. Don't mm. don't don't run from it. That's what I would do. Yeah, that's powerful. That's super powerful. Okay, before we move into the why, is there anything else we need to know about the anticipation? I mean, just the main thing is this is where you're going to, you know, when I say step one, don't run. Step two, make a U-turn. Step three, break free. Oh, yes, thank you. We never actually finished Yeah, that. I mean, this is where, I mean, it kind of these th those three steps go with the S, L, and A, and Y mm -hmm. in the sense that you are, I, I call it course correcting. Mm -hmm. You know, you're riding the ship, you're turning it all around, and so the, the steps kind of go with that. And, and as you're building your strategy and your leverage, you're also turning it around and you're, you're, 
you're starting to say, okay, at what point am I going to start presenting my arguments and, and and weighing my risks and determining, you know, uh, how can I start being ready to um, actually speak to this person and feel prepared to feel powerful, you know, and anticipating is also where am I going to do the negotiations? Is it their turf? Is it mine? What am I actually going to wear? How, what does my body language look like? What kind of clothing color, you know, am I going to, you know, how does that impact my, my mental state? You know, cause body language can also be m reading my body language, you know, reading their body language. There's so much that goes into all of that, but you know, a, a, a can be a lot of different things, but yeah. I, I, I want to know. <laughs> so let's go down that. So who's tough? Well, there's a lot that goes into that because home field advantage is a is a thing, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a power dynamic that also says, you know what, you're turf, you know, because. I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid to come to you. I'm not afraid to come to your lawyer's office, or I'm not afraid to come to your your office if it's a professional situation, right? And then by coming to your office, I can also read what's going on in your room. I can also see what's happening in your office. I can I can get some stuff that's happening over there. I can pick up some things by being in your turf too. So there's a lot of things that you get from being in, in the other person's turf. And if the person, um, the narcissist, let's just say in this situation, comes to your turf, does it also though open up the, uh, their ability to disrupt it? Potentially, yeah. Because then that almost becomes another power dynamic, right? I'm in your turf and I'm still going to run I'm it. in your turf, I didn't show up, uh -huh. you know, that sort of thing yeah. too. Okay, um, body language. So as you were talking, literally, There's like so I had, much with body language. Yeah, tell that's, me it, I, that's a whole other thing. I actually have a whole course on. Oh my god, body do you language. really? Yeah, because I literally had a whole flash, and I was like, okay, if you're meeting with the person, you don't want to be like all, you know, like hunched over no. and look powerless. I mean, you've got the Wonder Woman stuff. That's actually a thing with body language, like standing powerfully like that, right? But yes, but a part of me wonders would that trigger them more because they're like, oh my god, you know, like. Would that almost allow, uh, f trigger the narcissist to then want to uh, overpower you because you're coming in with strength? Authentic power always trumps their fake power. Standing in your power, knowing who you are, the way you walk in, just your air, your confidence is just, they will shrink from that. I mean, truly, just knowing who you are is, there's just something about that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they will feel that and they will sense that. But, you know, sticking out your hand, shaking their hand, using their name, you know, looking them in the eye and wearing something that makes you feel like a million bucks wearing a, a color that makes you feel good. You know, there's there's something powerful about that. Now, of course, if there's a domestic violence situation, sure. you know, I'm not, but, you know, I think there's there's something to be said for all of that. And thank you actually for giving that context. So a lot of what we're talking about is assuming that you're not in a very uh, physical violence uh, relationship, because I think that a lot of what we're talking about won't apply to that specific situation. Right. Um, but the, the hand thing and the look in the eye and saying their name, dude, like this is the shit that I freaking love. Because again, when the emotion that you're going through, when you feel like you've been manip manipulated, and especially when it's been a long time, like if it's been years and years, or you feel like it's a business partner that you've like really trusted with your you know whole being and they've, you've let them into your life and you share finances. I mean, like you have a vision together and you build something like that's really intimate. And so in those moments where it's just, I, I just want to say, that's a heartbreak, right? Where you find yourself in a situation where like the, the you actually see that the wolf is just in sheep's clothing, it can be heartbreaking. I've been through that 
especially in business. And it is actually heartbreaking because I wear my heart on my sleeve, even in business. And so once you've got that emotion and you're trying to do this breakup, it's very hard to not bring that emotion into it. And so I'm, that's why I love tactics like that, where it's, you know, look them in the eye, shake their hand, you know, don't be a uh, demure, like with your, you know, hunched over. Um, and then wearing the clothes that make you feel powerful. Because when you said, like, what colors are you going to wear? I was like, oh, shit. Like, I never even considered that. Oh, there's a that. whole thing on clothing color psychology. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, a whole thing. And, you know, and if you feel like you want to, like, scream in the shower beforehand or vomit or whatever, but, you know, like cry in your pillow behind, you know, do it Go all to a after. kickboxing class. You do it after or whatever <laughs> beforehand, you know, and, and in my new, um, I, I have this master high conflict certification course. Like I teach people how to do tapping and, you know, somatic breathing and th things like that to help you feel better while you're, you know, to get through this. But during those moments, you be in your power. Mm. You stand in your power. Do not let that person see you sweat. Yeah. You know, you stand in your power. That's so powerful. Um, okay, so now let's go to the why. Yes. So the why is really two parts. The first part is being on the offensive. So a lot of times when you are in negotiating, you don't, a lot of people don't start off on the offensive position. They feel like, oh, I, you know, I don't want to fight. I want this to be amicable. But that's reasonable person thinking, <laughs> right? I, I just explained the physiology of their brain. With a narcissist, you're either for them or against them. And if you're against them, you're public enemy number one. And so you're not getting that. Even if they say to you, oh, yeah, I don't want to fight either. That's not what's happening. And so you end up behind. You end up behind, you know, because they have they are behind the scenes doing things, lining things up against you. And then you're on the defensive, right? So you have to stay on the offensive. You have to. If you don't want to fight, you want to you want a good resolution. You want you want to come to a reasonable position. You have to stay on the offensive. You have to. Um, so that's you on the offensive. And then the other part is the a hundred percent of your of winning is your mindset. You know, I, I used to say eighty percent, but then Bob Proctor. Um, he, <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no it's a hundred. He, he corrected me, and I was like, you know what? You are so correct. <laughs> it is a hundred percent of of winning is your is your mindset, and you know, if you don't believe you can win, no one can help you. No one can help you. You know, you don't need like a good attorney. You don't need this. That, that is all giving your power away. You know, you need to just believe that you can do it. You can do it. I mean, it, it, you have the power. You know, what you think you become. I want to go back to actually to what you were saying about the offense thing. So how do you become an offense? Like how, what, what do those acts look like? Um, because my personal natural inclination is absolutely to go on the defense. Yeah, it means come right out of the gate doing whatever you need to, to take care of yourself. Don't go, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to wait and see what happens or I'm going to, not play, be the bad guy. I don't want to, I don't want to fight, you know, so it might be different for whatever situation you're in, but, you know, file whatever you need to file in court or take care of yourself, you know, whatever it needs to be. Don't hang back. That's my point. What if they start to threaten you, though, with things like, so for kids, right? I think that that's a big one in especially marriages. Yeah, it's usually a bunch of crap. I mean, you know, every time I've had those conversations with people, oh, you know, you're never going to see your kids again. You're not going to get the house and whatever. It's that's just crap. I mean, the law is the law. Mm. I actually met a woman that came up to me um, fairly recently, actually. 
And it was, it was a heartbreaking and heartfelt story all at the same time. And she came up to me, she'd seen an episode with me and Dr. Ramani, and she said, thank you, you saved my life. And she realized that his diamond was the house. Mm. And so she, he was threatening with the kids and he would threat, threaten to um, harm the children if she ever left. And what she realized was, oh, his diamond was just a house. So she was like, I didn't care about the house. So she just took her four kids, moved to this tiny little one-bedroom apartment, and she's like, I've never been happier. Oh. But to your point, though, it's like she could have fought that. Um, but kind of thinking about what you're looking for, going back to almost like the, the strategy, like what is that end goal? Like what right. is the thing that you're actually looking for? Um, and then... In that moment, I think she probably processed, right, the defending of like, no, but I should keep the house. I should, right, the, the kind of things that you think. Mm -hmm. um, but then when she started to just weigh the risk versus the reward, she's like, the risk of losing the house versus the reward of never having to be emotionally abused again um, right. was her deciding factor for her. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you should all over yourself, right? You should, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, is there anything else that we need to know about the why before we move on? Well, I mean, I always say like that you and you alone define your value. People will think what you tell them to think. And explain that actually, because I heard you say it's so powerful. Yeah. I had um, a situation one time where I was actually, I had been a lawyer for about eight years and then I had um, gone to work for uh, Morgan Stanley for a little while as a, um, as a, a, a broker, you know, and I had an opportunity then to go back to practice law because a friend of mine was leaving the uh, area and she was like, you know, I, I have a small caseload and I'm willing to give them to you, my cases, if you want to start a practice. And I thought, well, you know, nobody's ever going to be dropping a practice in my lap ever. And this is my opportunity to start a, a law practice. Now, I was in Naples, Florida, which is a very affluent community at the time. And I thought, okay, uh, I'm going to do this. But I was so worried that the people of Naples, Florida, which is a small but affluent community, uh, were going to think I was such a flake. And so I was talking to my business coach and I said, oh, people in here are going to think I'm such a flake. First, she was a lawyer. Now she's a, a financial advisor. Now she's back to being a lawyer again. And, I, and my business coach said, people will think what you tell them to think. She said, you can tell them to think that you're a flake or you can tell them to think that you are the only attorney in town that has a financial background. So therefore, you're actually more qualified than any other attorney, uh, family law attorney in town. So which story would you like to tell? And I was like, hmm, maybe I'll tell that story. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I did. And within two years, I had one of the most thriving family law practices in the state. And I was representing billionaires and celebrities and I had a very, very thriving practice. And, you know, I was, um, you know, representing people who very clearly weren't going to be hiring a flake. Mm -hmm. But had I been apologetic and I'm sorry and showed up like, oh, I, I know I, I'm kind of a flake. I shouldn't have done that. You know, that's what people would have seen me because people will think what you tell them to think. But I chose to stand in my power and was like, I'm the only family law attorney that has this background. I'm more powerful. I'm more, th this is who I am. And so people came to me and was like, I'm hiring you because you have this, you know, so people will think what you tell them to think. Mm. I think that's so beautiful because even in that story I just told about that woman, right, leaving her husband, she could have told herself the story of like, I can't believe that I got myself into this situation. I've spent the last 30 years of my life being, you know, emotionally and physically abused. Um, but she didn't. Like when I spoke to her, her story was, I'm a badass that left that relationship. I was like, fuck you, yeah, woman. Like, and just thinking about it's the same woman, it's the same freaking story, but the story she was telling herself before she found, you know, my content was the fact that she was 
that she was stuck and that this was the life. And she even said, I thought that I made my bed and I had to sleep in it for the rest of my life. And then by just making that shift, she did it, right? It wasn't me, she made that shift. But then that shift then allowed her to feel so damn confident and powerful after having left that relationship. And I'm not saying it is easy. God, Jesus, I am not dismissing anybody's story. Um, but I do believe in the power of the mind. Like yes, you said, the 100%. mindset part of it. Yeah. And so if anyone's listening to want to try and overcome their experience, to overcome that hardship they've gone through, the toxic relationship, whether it's a partner or a business relationship, what is that story you're telling yourself? Because even myself, um, my ex, uh, one of my business uh, people that I've been in business with, total narcissist. I mean, reading your book, it was literally like a script oh, no. of the narcissist. Like literally, ver freaking Baden woman. <laughs> oh, no. Like step by step. I was like, well, I wish I had this book because I would have spotted it. Well, if I had this book, I'd be like, hang on, it sounds like this blah, blah, blah. Um, but I didn't have the book. And so I was always beating myself up going like, oh my God, how did I like not see it coming? Yeah. I thought they were so charming. Um, but now I just give myself the grace and I, hey, look, you didn't know any different. So there's right. that. Um, and then the story that you tell yourself, right? It's like, oh, well now I, I can see it. And now I'm more powerful for having been through that experience because yeah. now I can see the signs. Totally. And that's why I love doing these shows with people like yourself because it's it's so revealing. And right. again, we we're in, like coming almost full circle of where we started. It was like, how do we take our power back? Right. Yeah. I mean, we take our power back by first of all education mm -hmm. like this, and you know, first of all, we say, okay, we get the education. Now we know, and then baby steps baby steps and giving ourselves grace and saying, okay, we didn't know it's okay. And, and, but we can get out of this. And, you know, they, the narcissist by and large, they probably aren't going to get the help and support that they need because they don't think they need the help. Correct. But you can, mm -hmm. anybody who's listening, you can, you have the power, you can, little by little baby steps. I mean, there's so many thousands of people who've taken my courses who've said, you know, you saved my life and they've been in horrible, horrible places. I know there's so many people who listen to you that have said, you've saved my life, who've been in horrible places. So there is hope, you know, little baby steps. You know, that's why I say step one, don't run. If the first step you take is just to say, my boundary today is I'm going to just start with disarming them by just saying today, my boundary is I'm going to be spoken to with respect. And that's something you absolutely have the right to demand. You know, I say there are certain things that are negotiable and there's certain things that are not. You know what's negotiable? Contracts, issues, terms. You know what's not negotiable? your self-worth, your self-respect, your self-esteem. Wow, that's so freaking powerful. So powerful. Um, you also, I love your freaking acronyms, by the way. You also have another one that's super useful, um, that's cool. And so when times get heated, you can use the acronym COOL. You don't mind breaking that down? Yeah, so cool words is what I, I like to use, which is, um, which is C, chill out. So, the first thing is when things get heated, you know, chill out. So take a breath, walk away, go walk around the room, go walk outside, take a depth, you know, get some fresh air, go into nature if you need to, you know, uh, nature is so wonderful just to get in, you know, uh, get some fresh air. And, you know, I say box breathing is really, really good. Uh, you know, sometimes when we are uh, in stress, we actually don't breathe enough. Mm. We breathe very, very shallow and it doesn't, we don't get enough oxygen into our bodies. So just chill out, take a breath, right? So the next thing is starting to observe their behavior. Just, the O? Yeah, the O, the O for the cool. Um, so just observing their behavior, just, oh, I can see that you're upset. I can see that, you know, you're angry. Um, you know, that observing that, you know, mm -hmm. observing it to them, right? 
And then the next thing is observing the situation, you know, observing what's happening, just taking yourself out of it. Again, that third party thing, not taking it personally, right? And then the the next thing is the L, letting their words go by you. You know, like I, I was I always picture it like dodgeball. When I was a kid, we we we, we played dodgeball. So, um, you know, just like observe their words. Oh, there it goes. I just saw it, you know, um, and it's just let it whiz by you. And then the words, the words part of it is something like a power word that it becomes your power word or, or words, mm-hmm. right? So it can be like, you know, um, you got this or powerful or, you know, whatever it is that is like your mantra or something like that. And you can actually write it out. You know, back when I was doing uh, trials, I used to actually have my power words. Like I would sort of like write it on the top of my, uh, yeah, yeah. I would put like, just like a P for power or powerful or something. I just don't remind myself who I was, you know, Mm. like, and I would just put it on the top of my trial notebook or something like that. I'd just look down and remind myself that I'm standing in my power today, you know, or so you, you you can just have like a symbol if you don't want anybody to see, see it, but just reminding yourself who you are, you know, it could be a, a phrase. It could be, um, you know, I am, it could be an, I am statement, you know, I'm a winner. I'm victorious. I am, you know, because whatever you, whatever follows I am is, uh, you know, an order that you're placing to the universe and just start pivoting into that instead of, you know, they always get their way or, you know, I never, I never get my way. They're always winning, you know, things like that. Catch yourself when you're saying things like that, because those are all orders that you're placing to the universe. You know, I mean, instead of doing that pivot and say, I am powerful. I am victorious. And if that feels like too much, you can just pivot it into, you know, I am starting to see the light. I am starting to, things are starting to go my way or whatever. But I like the words of like, you know, powerful or winner or, um, you know, something where you can just put like a word or phrase that is going to feel like a mantra to you that you're like feeling powerful, you know, like I'm, I've got this. Yeah. I love that so much. I love just even the P I, um, I just have alarms on my phone with like little emojis, like little muscle emoji. Like, yeah. Just, Come on, you got this Lisa. Yeah. yeah. You go um, girl. <laughs> so let's say you do all this work. The power of a narcissist though is to then lure you back. Mm-hmm. So you go through it and then you think, okay, Maybe I'm out. But then they do the cycle back again. So they do the love bombing again. And then you, uh, the next stage is a devalue stage. Mm-hmm. And you actually talk about the three Ds that go with the devalue stage. And I, again, you're freaking, the way you break this down is so uh, just beautiful to remember as well. So that anytime people are finding this, like as they're getting out, because you're building your confidence all along the way. And then they kind of come back at you with a love bombing. Um, and then the cycle begins again. But you were talking about the three Ds and you say it's devalue, debasing and degrading. Yeah. Um, take me through those three, if you don't mind. Well, I mean, those are just examples of, of things that they do during the devaluing stage. I mean, it's just, you know, you start to see who they really are during that stage. You know, you start to see these red flags during that stage where things are not lining up, where things are not what you thought that they were going to be. Mm -hmm. And so it could be in a number of different ways. Now, all of a sudden, you know, where you went from 50 text messages a day to uh, why, why are you bothering me? You know, I'm so busy at work. You know that I'm busy. Why, why, why are you, you're, you're such, you're, you're clinging on to me, you know? Um, and I, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to see you this weekend. Um, you know, uh, you know, um, that, that sort of thing, you know? Actually, as you're saying that, do you mind sharing that story about the woman that went to China? Because this is exactly like in business. Especially. Oh, yeah. that I actually coached her. That was in a really, really interesting situation where she was 
in a uh, like a Fortune 20 company over here or something, and she was a CFO and had gone to like a, a Ivy League school over here. Mm -hmm. And they this company in China that was based in Hong Kong actually wooed her to come over and told her that she would be CEO of China. And he wooed her over and told her that she could have anything she wanted as far as running the, the Chinese part of the company and that she could even have like the, all these women's initiatives and things like that that she wanted to be able to have and, and brought her over several times and said that um, she was going to be able to do all these different things in the company. So that's the and love bombing stage. Love bombing stage. And uh, she was really not looking to leave her other company, but he really made it so that she couldn't say no. Mm -hmm. So she signed a contract and her husband moved with her. She gets there and first week, there's no office really for her. They are like moving boxes out of this office. And there, she's basically told that she's not going to start with her new position right away. Now, they start paying her the salary, but she's told that she's not going to start with her new position right away. And that this guy who's the son of this billionaire family doesn't even really have time to meet with her immediately. And... So like two weeks goes by and she's like not even on the website yet and she can't get in to meet with the guy. And then she starts being told that she's difficult because she's trying to meet with the guy and, and that now it's being documented that she's difficult and all this crazy stuff is happening and you know, and that's the devalue stage. Yeah. You're emailing me too much. You're being difficult. Yeah. And she still isn't in this position that she's being been told that she's supposed to get. She's being paid the salary. So she's getting the money, mm -hmm. but she's not getting the position. And but yet she's now being documented in her file that mm -hmm. she's a problem. And um, so she ended up contacting me to say, hey, this guy's a massive narcissist. Like, what the hell do I do? Because whether you're in business or not, that story really hit me because it seemed like she did everything right. She did everything yeah, right. Yeah, going to China multiple times, having a contract. And so then to then find yourself in that position, A, I, thank you for telling me the story, uh, telling everyone the story because... I, again, want people to hear that it doesn't matter where you are, who you are. Like, it can happen to almost pretty much anybody. Yeah. And so this woman is, like, highly educated and she did everything, like, on paper, exactly what you would, I would tell somebody. Well, go check out the place first. Don't just say yes. Make sure the contract is airtight. Um, and so even in a relationship with someone's like, you know, it feel, felt like they were the right person. They were telling me they loved me. They introduced me to their parents. And then, like... A year later, you find out actually they're married with kids. Yeah. And then you start beating yourself up over how did I not see this coming? How did I end up here? Um, how did she process that? And then in hindsight, what would you have done differently? I mean, in that particular situation, I don't know. I mean, she did everything right. I mean, I guess she ended up negotiating something through lawyers and she ended up getting out of it. And she ended up starting her own business, by the way, where she ha she's helping women executives oh, and things amazing. like that. amazing. Yeah. I mean, so she's, it, it ended up fine for yeah. her. But, you know, she, but she went, found, found value, though, in that situation by did. using it to then help others. She, she did. I mean, but she went through hell, of course. you know, um, I, I, you know, but... 
she sure knows the signs of narcissism now. Mm. And that's in the language and the things they use. So like almost identifying it in the love bombing stage. Like mm -hmm. if someone is too over the top mm -hmm. and it's like, <clears throat> here's the problem though. When you feel badly about yourself, like I'm just going to speak for myself and the insecurity comes and someone's like, oh my God, you're amazing. You're like, ha oh. You know, like it makes yeah. you feel good about yourself. So right. it's very hard to go like, is this fake? And like, hang on a minute. Are they, you know, are they just trying to manipulate me? Like it's, it, you don't want someone to be so standard offish but at the same time identifying the love bombing and then realizing or um, breaking it down to say is this like warranted like how do they know I'm this good well if somebody is too good to be true and you know just too much too fast too overwhelming and then when you start to see these red flags they always have because you do see the red flags right at the beginning you do but they always have sort of an excuse for them, like a, 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 a like a, some kind of something to say about it right at the ready. Mm -hmm. Like there's, you know, and they, they kind of like dismiss it and they have like something to be able to say, you know, like, oh, you know, let's, uh, let's not look, let's not look at that. Let's not, let's not um, think about that. Like everything else is so great. You know, I mean, I saw red flags right at the beginning in my business situation and I did even say something about it, but you know. To somebody else? No, no, to the person. Oh, what did you say? Well, I mean, I, you know, I saw that there was some copying of me on, mm -hmm. on her website, you know, of things that I was already doing. And I did say something to her and she was like, oh, no, no, I know, I know. I had already said something to my husband about that and I'm not going to do that or whatever. And, I, and it's like, you just want to believe in the good. You want to believe in the good about people. You know, I just think that we want to believe that people are inherently good or we want, like, so I think in that moment, you want what you want with that person. You you want to have a relationship with that person in that moment. And you think it's going to be so good. And so you don't you don't want to believe that that red flag is is what it is. And so you kind of turn that red flag pink or whatever it is and you kind of dismiss it away. You bat it away yourself. And I think that I would never do that again myself. Click here right now to learn what the narcissist will do when they feel like they're losing control of you. Now here's where you gotta be careful though, Lisa, right? Narcissistic people for their lack of empathy, lack of self-awareness, lack of regard for others, have an uncanny ability 